I want to introduce Brett Butler to you tonight. Come share with us, brother. I can tell you that uh, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank a few people. First, Stormy, thanks again for that, but first time I get to meet Jill. Jill, thanks for being here. A friend of mine, Luther, that came. Luther, thanks for being a part of that. I've been able to spend some quality time with Mark, okay, and with Brent, and I got to meet Cindy today, and I'll tell you what, it's just been special, and Pastor Tony. But, you know, I, I believe that each and every one of us has a purpose in life. And mine was to play with the Atlanta Braves for my whole career. <laughs> At least that's what I thought. And I wanted to, and as Mark said, he was mad, I cried. I mean, how can Brett Butler, gone with the wind, not be in Atlanta for his whole career? I don't know why, but God had another plan for that. And so what I want to do is share a little bit about that. But with all the hunters in the room, let me ask you this. What are you hunting for in life? To hit the target, the heart of your target, what does that look like for you? Could it be fortune? Could it be fame? He with the most toys wins, the biggest gun. Well, my story and what I was hunting for, I'd like to share. But first, I'll tell you a little bit about my family. My wife, Evelyn, and I have been married. It'll be 42 years on February 13th. To some, that's a big deal. To others, it's not because as a professional athlete, I want you to understand that 80% of professional athletes across the board that get married, okay, those that get married, okay, 80% end in divorce. And out of those that get divorced and get married again, 50% and in divorce. And the reason why is because they buy into the facade of what the world perceives them to be. And they don't have a foundation on God, family, and then their sport. So, Evelyn, for 42 years, I've got a daughter, Abby, who lives in Nashville, 41. A daughter, Stephanie, who's going to be 40 on the 9th, who just moved to Nashville from California. A daughter, Katie, 38. And yes, I was finally able to have a son, and Blake is 36, married, and I've got two grandsons who are 10, and Madison's eight, Bryce is 10. So I was born in Los Angeles, California. I lived off of Amarado Street, which was about three blocks from Dodger Stadium, ironically enough. And we moved to Libertyville, Illinois as a teenager. But what I really was hunting for in life, the target of my heart was to be a Major League Baseball player. That's all I ever wanted to do. When I was in first grade, I wrote an autobiography that said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a Major League Baseball player. And that's all I ever wanted to do. And my father said this to me, if you have a dream or a desire or a goal to do something, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. You youngsters out there, if you have a dream or a desire or a goal to do something, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. If you don't believe in yourself, you'll never make it. But go out there and do the very best you can so that if you make it, you're satisfied. But if you don't, you can be content saying, I did everything I could to make it. And that's what I tried to do. So in high school, I want you to know, I, I kind of grew up in church. You know, I read my Bible on an occasion. I prayed on an occasion. and I went to a Fellowship of Christian Athletes conference in Fort Collins, Colorado in 1973. And while I was there, I was with all my buddies, and I'm going to win all the races because I'm a fast guy. And on a Thursday evening, a gentleman got up to speak. 
And he said this, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? Now I'm sitting there with, and he got my attention, or should I say God did? And so what he did is he said, and I wasn't sure if I was to die tonight, would I go to heaven? And he proceeded to say, well, you got to believe that there's, there's a God. you got to believe that you're separated from, from God. And you got to believe that 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to die on the cross. He says, if you confess it with your mouth and believe in your heart, you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, he will come in. And he goes, so if you want to do that, you come down in front and say that little prayer, and I'm like, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. And I ran back to my dorm room, and I got on my knees, and I said, Lord, if you're who you say you are, Father, I believe that you're there, and I believe that I'm separated from you by my sin. And I believe 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to die on the cross for my sins. Father, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Now, I want you to know, Bells didn't go off, whistles didn't go off, but I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I was to die, that I would go to heaven. John 3, 16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that who believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. See, I believe that our Lord has created us so that we have a loving relationship with him and that he has a plan for each and every one of our lives that he would or should be the target of our heart. Hunting for a relationship with Christ has given me direction, purpose, but most of all in my life, it's given me peace. Why? Why? Because when I try to do things on my own, <laughs> I mess it up every time. You see, I am a sinner who has fallen short of the glory of God. And I am a lost soul without his love and his guidance, his correction, and most important, the direction in my life. You see, 1 John 1.8 says, If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. But if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See, as a high school baseball player, as a freshman, I, I played freshman ball. As you can see, I'm six foot three, 230. I was five feet tall and I weighed 89 pounds as a freshman in high school. How about that? As a freshman, I played freshman baseball. As a sophomore, I played sophomore baseball. As a junior, I was on the varsity. But I kept score because the cheerleaders were pretty and the coach wouldn't let me play. My senior year, I had 32 at bats. That was it. The reason why, and we know how politics were, our best player was our catcher and his brother Played my position, so I didn't get to play a whole lot. But he got hurt. So I got to play in the playoffs, and I got a few hits, and things went well. And so at the banquet, our high school banquet, my coach says, hey, where, where are you going to go to school? I said, I'm going to walk on at Arizona State and play baseball at Arizona State. In 1975, Arizona State was the best school in the nation for baseball. And my coach, again, at least this is the way I remember it as a senior, is that <laughs> Brett Butler thinks he's going to Arizona State. He couldn't play for me. But remember what my dad said. If you have a dream or a desire or a goal, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. If you don't believe in yourself, nobody else will. <clears throat> so I went home and I told my father that I was going to go to Arizona State. And he goes, well, and he was a psychology major. He goes, well, you better have something to fall back on. I'm like, no, Dad, I'm going to play ball. So he says, I can only pay for two years of school. I said, all right, you pay for the first two. I'll figure out how to pay for the other. So I walked on the junior varsity. There were 209 of us that walked on. 
and they kept eight of us. I hit 340. And I go in, I'm like, hey, coach, I, I, I need part of a scholarship. He goes, Brett, we can't do anything as, a, as a, a sophomore, but maybe as a junior. And I went home, and I played. I had to play some ball. So in the fall, I'm playing on a team called, ready? The Dill Brothers, which is a pickup team in Zion, Illinois. I grew up in Libertyville. It was about an hour north. And I went up there because I had a buddy I played against. He hit third for Zion and played on the varsity, and I was the scrabini sitting on the bench. And we became friends. And he loved the Lord. And I went up there, and while I was up there in the summer, this guy on another team in Lake Zurich says, hey, we can use an outfielder at Southeastern Oklahoma State University. Now, you got to understand something. I was a city boy. I was born in L.A., but raised in Liberty. So, I mean, and now, Podunk, USA, I'm going to go down there. He's going to start talking about chicken fried steak and fishing. <laughs> so I go to Durant, Oklahoma, and I see the coach. And I think, okay, isn't that what we do? We try to think that we can figure out our lives. So I come home, and it was nice. And mom and dad are like, what are you going to do? I said, ah, you know what? Southeastern, I'm going back to Arizona State. And I went to bed that night. And I can't sleep. Now, I, I sleep like a log, but I can't sleep. I can't sleep. When I get up, and there's, there's a reason. There's a reason. I walked in the kitchen and opened up the refrigerator, and my mom's standing there in the dark. She said, the Lord just woke me up. You've got to go to Southeastern, don't you? I'm like, Mama, I don't know why, but when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, I didn't accept him like this. I gave him my life completely to do with it what he wanted. So, Mom, I, I got to go to Southeastern. Well, I went down there, and I met the head coach. His name was Don Parm. They called him Doc. First thing he asked me is, hey, you like chicken fried steak? You like fishing? I'm like... <laughs> and I went there, and I was a two-time All-American second team. I got drafted in the first round by the Atlanta Braves for a million dollars. No. I got drafted in the 23rd round for a thousand bucks. As a favor to my college coach, he had known the bird dog for a long time and just got me in the door. Hmm. Can we trust God? The answer is yes. So I remember I got drafted, and I'm in rookie ball, and I'm in A ball, and all of a sudden, I shared a little bit earlier with the guys, but I'm in A ball, and I go to instructional ball, and they need a leadoff guy. Bobby Cox is the manager, and he needs a leadoff guy, and he comes down to watch me play, and I get 12 hits in four, in four games, eight months, and I get invited to major league camp. Now, if you, if you follow baseball, you got rookie ball, we had two A balls, a double A, a triple A, and then the big leagues. I'm, I'm a long way away. But I get invited to big league camp, and there's eight cuts. And they cut seven, they only got one more guy, and if it's not me, I make the team from A ball. Huh? Whoa. Lord, you're awesome. Because that's my goal, right? So all of a sudden I hear, hey, Brett, Bobby wants to see you. Oh, crap. I remember walking in. I said, yeah, Bobby. He goes, I want to keep you, but they won't let me. But I'm like, Bobby, you need a leadoff guy. Didn't I tell you I can get on base? Didn't I show you that? He goes, I just want you to go down. I want you to have a good year. And if you keep going, I'll call you up. I said, fine, where am I going? He goes, you're skipping double A and going to Richmond. Now I'm only one step away. I'm like, and I remember turning around and walking out. And I said, Lord, I don't understand why you're sending me to Richmond, but I trust what you have for me is greater than I can ever have for myself. And I know that there's a reason. So I went down there, and um, one of my teammates had a girlfriend who got the housing for the players. 
And so her roommate, we took them out to thank them for getting us a place to live. And I saw this little fox, I mean, she was enough to make a train, and you know, a, a, a train take a dirt road. I mean, she was just beautiful. <laughs> and I asked her out, and she goes, no, you ball players are all the same. I'm like, come on. Why don't we just go out and go bowling and have something to eat? We went out, and the third day, and I sat her on the, sat her down, and I said, you're going to think I'm the craziest fool in the world, but I believe that God put you in my life to be my wife. Third day. She said, I just want you to know, I just accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior and asked him to put a godly man in my life. And I think it's you. Remember what I said earlier? On February 13th, it'll be 42 years. God has a plan if we'll just simply trust him. So now, August 20th comes. They call me. They say, hey, you're going to the big leagues. I remember getting there, and they rushed me upstairs, and I signed my contract, and Bobby's like, get him downstairs. He's, he's in the lineup tonight. And I get downstairs, and there I am. I'm, I mean, I'm up in top. It's me, and, you know, Dale Murphy's going to be right there. Dale's going to be right there. And I remember walking up, and I remember my first at bat. I dug in, and I had two thoughts. First thought was, Lord, please don't let me wet my pants. <laughs> and the second thought was, just let me put the ball in play. And I remember that I grounded out to the second baseman. We are playing the Mets. But in the seventh inning, Dan Boitano was pitching, and I hit a double down the right field line, and Drove in a run, stole a base, scored a run, and I made it. I'm here. I got interviewed, and the lights were on me. <laughs> and then everybody left. And I sat there in my locker by myself. And as I got up and I walked back to my hotel room, I sat on my bed and I said, Lord, is this it? I, my whole life, have strived to be a major league baseball player to realize that it's not lasting, that the only thing that's truly lasting is my relationship with you. Amen. But you know, at times we don't believe, do we, that God, we can trust him. Because if we really believe in God's love for our life, then we will wholeheartedly give up our life for him because he supposedly knows what's best. When you surround your life, surrender your life to, to the Lord, then that is when you are allowing God's plan to work in your life, not yours. And his plan is much better for you than you could ever imagine. But that doesn't mean that your life is going to go the way that you think it should. But remember, you will be standing on a firm foundation with the God of salvation who truly loves you if you allow him to. But sometimes God answers our prayers by not giving us what we want, but by challenging us to change and trust him. Let me say that again. Sometimes God answers our prayers by not giving us what we want, but by challenging us to change and trust in him. Brett Butler, Atlanta, gone with the wind, my whole career, and I get traded to Siberia, I mean Cleveland. <laughs> Cleveland was the armpit of baseball back then. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I remember calling my dad up, and I'm like, Dad, my dad was one of those staunch Marines. Hey, son, I'm, I'm proud of you. You know, one of those. And I called him up, and I said, Dad, I got some good news, and I got some bad news. He says, well, what's the good, good news? I said, I think I'm still in the big leagues. He said, well, what's, what's the bad news? I said, Dad, I got traded to Cleveland. My father said this to me. 
I never thought I would live to see the day that my son would play in a Cleveland uniform. That was my favorite team growing up. But ironically enough, when I was in college, I had a dream that my father wasn't saved. And I called my dad up. I said, Dad, I, I got to know, Dad, if you, if you were to die, Dad, would you go to heaven? And he says, Son, absolutely. I said, Why? He goes, Because God can't lie. I said, What do you mean? He goes, Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, I, I knock at the door of your heart. If you open up your heart, let me come in. I will be with you always. I'll never leave you, never forsake you. And I have done that. And the reason why I share that with you is because that December, my mom calls me and says, hey, dad's had a heart attack and they gave him a 50-50 chance of living. I said, all right, mom, I'll be there. Mom, I'll be there tomorrow. Make reservations and I call her back and she goes, he died. My dad was 49 years old when, I died, when, when he died. But don't feel bad because my father is where we're trying to get to even though we don't think that at times, do we? And I don't think my father would want to come back. So I'm in Cleveland for four years, and then I get an opportunity to be a free agent. And like I said, I was born in L.A., but I grew up in Fremont, California, and my favorite player was Willie Mays, and I get to sign with the Giants. I was telling some of the guys earlier about meeting Willie in spring training, and I had Willie Mays on this side of my locker, and I had Willie McCovey, and man, I was like, oh. It was unbelievable. But again, how God has the ability to put things in perspective. Because we have the 89 World Series. I want you to know, in 1989, it was an earthquake World Series, but I want you to know that we had a general manager who was, a, who was Jewish, and he didn't like Christians. We had 21 Christians on that team. He said that Christians are weak. I'm like, Al, am I weak? You see, no, no, you're different. You're, no. I love Jesus. But he had this idea. And isn't that in our life what we're supposed to do? Is we're supposed to live out the example so people see Christ in our life. But when we had the Earthquake World Series, it made me just realize that baseball is just a game. And that the most important thing that we can have is our relationship with God, our relationship with our wife and our children and our friends, and then what kind of example are we going to leave on this earth? So, Jump forward, so I am in San Francisco for three years, and in 1991, I become a free agent. Now, I'm going to give you a little insight on this story, okay? I make a mistake. As a free agent, you don't say where you want to play. But I was dumb enough to say, there's only two places I want to play. I either want to go back to Atlanta, or I want to play with the Dodgers. And I won't get into all the specifics of it other than my best friends had a relationship with one of the executives in the Braves organization. And he's talking to him, and my agent's trying, and I'm like, just tell him to call me, and we'll figure this out. And he never calls me, and the, uh, and the Dodgers offer me contract, and... I signed with the Dodgers. Headlines in the Atlanta Constitution, Butler takes the money and runs to L.A. and doesn't give me a chance to sign him. But God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. So I signed with the, with the Dodgers in 1991. And I'm playing with them, and I had a lot of fun. And so... In 1994, I'm on the board of the Players Association. 95, I'm on the board of the Players Association. And I hit 314 for the Dodgers that year. And I'm in the winter meetings. And now they're going to ostracize the board, and the board. So the Dodgers don't offer me a contract. And I go home and I'm like, all right, Lord, what would you have for me? And my wife says this to me. I don't care where we play, but there's no way we're playing in New York. And I think God's got a sense of humor because the only team that would offer me a contract was the New York Mets. Fred Wilpon called me up and he goes, I don't like what they're doing. And I'm like, you know what? 
I'll never forget you, and I'll play for half of what they were going to offer me. So I went there, and here I am in Gotham City, I mean in New York City. <laughs> and I'm like, Lord, I don't understand, but I trust in what you are doing in my life. Well, my sister calls me on the phone and she says, hey, you got to fly home. Mom, mom's had a seizure and we got to go to the doctor. So I go in with my mom and they said, hey, Betty, I want you to know you have got terminal cancer and you've got four to six weeks to live. My mom loved Jesus. And my mother's response was, well, if Jesus had to suffer a little bit, I can. He promised me he wouldn't give me something I couldn't handle. That's how my mama was. So, my mom dies shortly after that. Well, I'll back up. We're going to go to Chicago to play. My mom, we were in Chicago. And I stunk when I played the Cubs because I always tried too hard. That was home. And I went there, and my mom's on oxygen, and she wants to go. My mom, hospice, no. She went all four days. I got 12 hits in four days. And shortly after that, I'm talking to my mom on the phone like, hey, mom, I'm coming back. Mom, mom. My mom passes away while I'm on the phone. We take my mom and we fly her to California and we bury her next to my dad. And I fly back to New York to play a series against the Dodgers and the general manager calls me in the office and he goes, you need to go, I, I gotta tell you this, we, I just want you to know the Dodgers are in town and we just traded you back to the Dodgers. And we've taken your stuff out of our locker room and put it in their lot." <laughs> what? what? Ready? When I was in New York, Every day off, I flew home to see my mom in Chicago. I couldn't have done that if I was in L.A. See how God works if we'll simply allow him to do that. So in the winter of 1995, I, I get a sore throat. That's why I'm so raspy. And I'm a hypochondriac by nature. I'll just confess that to you right now. Always been. So I went to the doctor and he says, ah, oh, you just got tonsillitis, no big deal. Gave me some antibiotics and I go to spring training. Make a long story short, Tommy calls me in in, uh, in May and he goes, hey, big boy, I'm going to give you a couple of days off. And that's like, hey, old man, you can't play anymore. So I said, Skip, I'm going to go home and get my tonsil out and I'll be back in five weeks. I go home. They wake me up and they tell me, you have squamous cell carcinoma cancer. But remember what I said earlier about God having a plan? He knows our days. He knows the day we're born. He knows the day we're going to die. And I'm like, all right, Lord, let your will be done. Help me to be an example for you, for the doctors, for the nurses, and let your light shine brightly, Father. And if you take me, Father, thank you for the privilege of living a life to honor you. So I asked the doctors, what are their chances? He goes, ah, 15 to 70%. I said, well, what are the numbers that I'd ever play baseball again? He goes, you'll never play again. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Put a number on it, one in 100, one in 1,000? Oh, it's probably one in 5,000. And I said, well, that was one in 10,000 that I get to the big league, so I've already cut that in half. And if God wants me to play, I'll play again. I went from 165 to 140. My 15-year-old daughter picked me up in her arms and put me out on the porch while I was going through all my radiation. I walked back on the field the Dodger Stadium on September 10th of that year to a standing ovation of 50,000 people to show the glory of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That my God 
And thing was, wouldn't allow me to continue to play, which he did. 97 was my last year, and then I was out of baseball for seven years, and my wife, Eveline, we had breakfast one morning, and she says, okay, you have my permission. I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, well, if you want to get back in the game, you can. I'm like, you don't know what you're saying. First of all, I want to manage in the big leagues, so I'm going to call Will, Fred Wilpon up, because I like Fred, and he'll let me manage his rookie club. So I did, I managed his rookie club, and then from there, what ended up happening was that Bob Melvin became the manager of the Arizona Diamondbacks, and he asked me to be his first base coach. Now, I want to manage, but okay, Bob, I'll come and help you a little bit. And I did that. And while I was there, my only son, who was 16 and a half, got into big time, big time trouble. And so my wife and I sat and prayed and tried to do everything we could and the Lord put it on our heart that we needed to send our son, our only son, to wilderness. I want you to know, I've been through three bouts of cancer and a stroke. And the hardest thing I've ever had to do was send my son to wilderness. And I remember dropping him off in Bend, Oregon. And I'm like, son, this is going to expand our ministry at some point. And he goes, I don't want to hear that crap. Get these people out of here. And when he walked out the door, my wife and I sat there and bawled our eyes out. And the lady there goes, it's so refreshing to see parents that love their kids. The reason why I share that with you is my son was there, ironically enough, for 40 days and 40 nights. After he came out, he went to boarding school. And in the meantime, we moved to Scottsdale because my son could not go back into the environment in Atlanta. We left all of our close friends. We jump forward. My son's been happily married for 11 years. He's got a beautiful wife. We've got two grandsons. And in 2019, my son said this to me, hey dad, you think we'll ever share our story? And so on Father's Day of 2019, there were fathers and sons that hadn't talked to them, each other in a long, long time come and hear my son and I share. And at 32 years old, my son surprised me by saying, it took me till two years ago to forgive my parents for what they did to me. He loves Jesus. His wife loves Jesus. And my son was the prodigal son. And I share that with you because sometimes we just don't understand until we simply trust God. So after that, I managed in A ball, I managed in double A, um, and then I'm in double A and I'm managing, I'm at third base, and all of a sudden I get a wave in my head, I don't know what that, what it is, and I have a stroke on the field. On the cerebellum, and I go to the doctor, and my balance is off for about two or three months. And I go, all right, Lord, I don't understand. And I rolled for a year in the organization. And then I managed the AAA club in Reno. 14 and, okay, at the end of my 2013 season, somebody asked me to be a third base coach in Miami. And I prayed about it. I'm like, Lord, should I do this? And I got a, in my spirit that I need to go do that. And I went there and I want you to know it was the worst two years of my life. I went to Miami hunting. My target was to be a manager in the major leagues. But sometimes, as I said, things don't go the way that we think that it should. I never managed in the, in the big leagues. Why? Because I was hunting for the wrong target. My target was for what I wanted and not what the Lord wanted for me. He had something else much better for me, but I just didn't see it at the time. But why? Again, because I was focused on me and the wrong target and not what God had for my life. He wanted me to go home to Scottsdale, Arizona and start hunting for men who were hunting for something in their life with no direction. 
to teach them and give them a target of understanding of what it looks like to have a true relationship with a living God. And that is what I'm doing with my life right now. That's the target of my life. That is my purpose. That is my satisfaction. Right now, I am discipling a Paul Timothy discipleship with one of the pastor's sons in my church. And I want you to know, in the eyes of the world, the fortune and the fame, I have been successful. But I want you to know that success is worldly and it goes away. But pouring into the lives of men and women and boys and children is the greatest treasure that you can ever give to anybody in this world. And to me, that would be my challenge to each and every one of you. I share all of this with you to let you know that God loves you and that he will direct every step of your life if you will only let him. God's unfailing love and compassion will see you through anything that you're going through. Now, or time to come. We lean on his strength for the future, not on the failures from our past. We have to surrender those and lay them down. John 10.10 10 says this, say that Jesus came to give us life, freedom, and a relationship with him. He is our hope, and the only source of our true peace. But let's pause for a moment. Let's take a look at the world. What direction are we heading in? Are we heading in a direction of love and peace and contentment and the loving relationship with God and others? Or are we heading in the opposite direction? And why is that? Because we are hunting for the truth of life. But what is the truth? A lot of people are saying the truth is what I say it is. But what is the heart of the matter? Here is the truth. That all of us are born and that all of us will die. All of us are sinners who fall short of the glory of God. And I had a friend of mine, pastor friend, say this to me one time. You are more wicked than you could ever imagine, but more loved than you can either dream about. John 14, 6 says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. You see, God knows what is going on in yours and my heart. Why? Because he made you. God knows each and every one of us. He knows what you're hunting for and what the target your heart is really looking for. Romans 8, 27 and 28 says this, And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all those who work together for God, for those who are called according to his purpose. But the world does not see things that way. We are all self-absorbed, and evil is everywhere. Why? Because they're not hunting for the Lord. They're hunting for their own thing. Everybody wanting their own way with no concern for the others around them. Just look at the hate and the ugliness going on around the world. But with this, it is obvious that God his intended is to allow sinful humanity to run its course until at a hidden time, he is going to come forward and he's going to intervene on our behalf. And I believe that is the absolute truth. And I believe that it's going to be sooner than later. That is the heart of the matter. But without the rescue of God's grace, we are all wise fools in our own mind, heading for the danger that we simply don't see. That is why 
The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 125, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Today, you will be tempted to buy into the delusion that you're smarter than God and that your way is better than his. But I want you to know, God's smarter than you are. You might not think that, but he is. You know why? Because he made you. So stop and confess the utter foolishness of ever thinking that you're smarter than God and run to him. Run to his wisdom. Pray that the one who is the definition of what is wise and true would, by his grace, make you wise and true. That is, a person who loves God's wisdom more than his own. Confess it. Don't be self-righteous. Don't let that crush your prayers. You see, you really don't have any excuse. None of us does. Romans 1.22 says this, for his invisible attributes, namely his internal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that has been made, so we are with no excuse. Well, how about this? I believe that everyone's name, everyone's name is written in the book of life. Exodus 32, 33 says this, but God said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out, I will blot their name out of my book. So let me ask you this. If you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? Ponder that, think about that for a moment. Remember what my father said in Revelations 3.20, I knock at the door of your heart, Jesus. If you open up your heart and let me in, I will be. That's knowing that there's a God, knowing that you're separated from God by your sin, believing that Jesus died on the cross, confessing you're a sinner, asking Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, and then accepting it. God uses all proper means to awaken sinners and to cause them to open up to him. You're not here by accident. You're here because God had an ordained plan for you to be here. Question for you. In your inner spirit, what are you hunting for in life? What is your target? What is that bullseye? The weak and ever-changing target you're hunting for, is that in, of the world? Or the never-changing target you're hunting for is a strong, powerful, and never-changing relationship with a living God. But here's the point. You get to choose one way or another. In conclusion, when I was lying on my bed thinking that I might die from cancer. I wasn't concerned about how rich or how famous I was. My concern was about my relationship with Jesus, my relationship with my wife and my children and my friends, and what kind of positive example am I going to leave in this world when I die? Because frankly, nothing else really matters in this world. That and continues to me, that is, and continues to me, the target of my heart. That is what I am hunting for, and that is my bullseye. So again, I will say it. If you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? I want you to know something. In my sharing this evening, that if what you have heard from me has been spoken from my flesh, I hope you forget it. But I hope that if what you've heard from me tonight has been spoken from my spirit about the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me and that has pricked your heart, I hope that you will remember it. I would like to pray for us right now. But after I pray, Pastor Tony will come up. So if you guys, if you all would just bow your head and let me pray. Father God, I thank you for the honor 
and the privilege to be in this room, in this auditorium here, and in the other, the other buildings, Father, that are tapped in. But Father, we know that this isn't by accident, and we know that, Father, you have a perfect plan for each and every one of us. And my prayer is that, Lord, that you would move in the hearts of those that are here tonight, that, Father, they would recognize that you are the God of salvation and that we are separated from you by our sin, that, Father, they would accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and that they would confess that and accept him as Lord and Savior. Search us, O Lord, and know our hearts. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in us and lead us into everlasting. Create in us, Lord, a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Please don't cast us from, our, from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and grant us, Lord, a, a willing spirit to sustain us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. <clears throat> I love Brett's story of perseverance, right? He um, faced one challenge after another, and he persevered, and he kept on going. And why? Because he had a relationship with Jesus Christ. The reason why Brett could overcome is because Jesus Christ overcame. The reason why Brett could have a comeback story is because Jesus Christ had the ultimate comeback story. He was raised from the dead. I mean, he, you see, that's the, the whole reason why Jesus Christ came. Jesus came into our brokenness. We live in a broken world, don't we? Right? We're, we're surrounded with brokenness. We've got brokenness in our own life. Why? Because we're all sin. We, we live in this brokenness. But that's the amazing thing about our God. Our God didn't stay in some ivory tower in heaven, no. He came down into this world. He, he entered into our brokenness. And so his simple reality is this, is that Jesus Christ came to this world to save us from our brokenness. I mean, Jesus Christ lived the perfect life that you couldn't live. Why? That I couldn't live. Because we're all sinners. And Jesus lived that perfect life because he's sinless. But then here's the amazing thing. Jesus Christ died the death that we deserve to die. The wages of sin is death. Jesus took that death. Think about this. Jesus died on the cross in your place and for your sin. You go, how do you know that? Well, God proved it by raising him up from the dead. And so now that because Jesus Christ is alive, he can give you that life. Because Jesus Christ overcame, he can help you overcome. Because Jesus Christ died for your sins, you can experience forgiveness of sins. Now, listen to me. Knowing that in your head is not enough. You gotta believe it in your heart. Some people miss heaven by 18 inches. Now, you go, well, how does that happen? Jesus says you need to repent and believe the gospel. I think of it like this. Brent mentioned that he went from team to team, right? Every time he went to a new team, what did he have to do? He had to change jerseys. And the, he not only had to change jerseys, but you know what? You really had to change some loyalty. But what Jesus is saying to you and I is it's time to change the teams. It's time to, to get on team Jesus. It's time to repent of this world and following after this world and saying, okay, Christ, I'm gonna choose to follow you. And when you do that, the Bible says, he forgives us. It's an amazing verse. The Bible says this. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever, that's you, <laughs> will call on the name of the Lord, that's Jesus, will be saved. I believe that right now there are many of you in your heart of hearts, you know it's time. It's time to change teams. It's time to repent of this world and call on Jesus to be your Lord. Now, I wanna give you that opportunity right now. And so this is what I encourage you to do. I want everybody here, just bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray a prayer of surrender to Jesus. 
And I'm gonna pray this out loud, and if you desire to pray this from your heart, I just encourage you to pray this from your heart with me. Would you pray this? Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I know that I've sinned against you. Please forgive me. I turn from myself and I turn to you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Come into my life and be my Lord. From this day forward, I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.